Well, union greetings, APW family. Great to be here with you uh, for our monthly live stream. Uh, I always welcome this opportunity to share some uh, important news with you and to hear from you. We have many great questions that you sent in in advance. Uh, our live stream is kept to an hour and I can be able to deal with all of them, but we have categorized them. We're gonna try to answer as many as possible. Uh, last month on the uh, live stream, I had asked our uh, legislative political director, Judy Beard, to join us to talk about some of the important uh, updates in the legislative fight. Uh, and this month I've, I've asked uh, Brother Van Zimmerman, our industrial uh, relations director to come on with me and he's gonna come on later in the show and share some important information on the health and safety fight and some updates on the contract negotiations that are upon us soon. So again, greetings all to uh, APW members and our good friends that have joined us. Certainly hope everybody's safe in this still dangerous COVID world, staying healthy, your families and coworkers uh, we hope are well. COVID is still here. We still have to remain vigilant. Uh, it seems like in the last few days that this pandemic may be starting to abate. That would be very good news for all of us. Uh, the vaccines seem to be making a difference. Uh, the vaccines are now readily available in most states. We had really hoped and worked hard with management at our level to try to get the vaccines right into the workplaces we were unable to do it. It's just a chaotic system that was in place with 68 different entities uh, uh, in, in the different states. But the fact that it's now opened up in most states, for those who are 16 year older, we, older, we know many of you uh, have, have gotten the vaccines and it, uh, hopefully it uh, seems to be making a difference, but we certainly urge all of you, uh, and I know I speak for all the national uh, leaders, we urge all of you to, uh, if, you, if you want the vaccine, to get it. I've been vaccinated. It's a personal choice. It's not a condition of employment. We're gonna make sure it's not, but it's there uh, and it seems to be helping. Tied into COVID is the uh, emergency federal employee leave that you all know something about now. What you may not know is how instrumental the APW was in getting that law into the American res uh, uh, Rescue Plan. Uh, we're still waiting for guidance from OPM. The Office of Personal Management has instructed all the agencies, including the post office, uh, that they have to wait for the uh, guidance, but OPM hasn't acted. In the meantime, it's the law. Post office is, is taking it two weeks at a time, uh, and we will keep you posted. The word is, but we've heard it before, there's supposed to be guidance by the end of the week. If there is, we'll certainly share that with all, all, uh, all of you. Since we last spoke, management has uh, introduced their 10-year plan, uh, business plan, strategic plan, whatever you want to call it. So let me share a few thoughts on that. We certainly published at the time it came out. I call it the good, bad, and the ugly after the move. There's some good things in the plan, such as their approach to legislation, fixing the pre-funding debacle of the, uh, the, they were the post office had to fund future retiree health care costs, drain the post office of all the money. There's some uh, good things in there, good ideas about retail being uh, used in a local way to, to, to drive customers into the post office. Uh, there's some very good idea of capturing the growing package market. Uh, there's some things that aren't in there that we're glad aren't in there. There's no attacks in words, at least, on workers' rights and, uh, and uh, uh, benefits. Uh, but there's also some very bad in the plan. And that's, there are a number of ingredients that we believe will slow down service, slow down mail. And when that happens, puts our jobs at risk and it puts the people's service at risk. And unfortunately, what management's moving with the quickest in the plan is not the better stuff, but the bad stuff. Uh, and so they've already filed cases with the Postal Regulatory Commission to slow down mail service standards, so it would take longer to send a letter. If it's going longer distance, they want to take more mail off planes and put them on trucks. Uh, look, there are real challenges out there for the Postal Service, but the answer is not, should not be, and cannot be slowing down mail, diminishing service, and driving away revenue. The other part of the plan that we just got news today, that was written into the plan in, in, in general, there were conversations with management since, is uh, the post office gave us official notification today at 11 a.m. that they plan to restart the plan closings and consolidations that they did not finish in 2015. Uh, 
Uh, that's also bad news for the people of the country. It's bad news for the workers. Uh, we posted a short article on the website today. If you haven't uh, had a chance to look at it, take a look. Um, we're in the fight. This is not a new fight for us. Uh, once the plan came out and it had this general thrust that they were going to restart the plant closings and the consolidations, I appointed uh, our vice president, Debbie Zeredi, to lead a committee with the five APW regional coordinators to strategize with a fight back. And now that we know some of the places that they're targeting, their management is initially targeting 18 processing plants. This committee is going to work directly with all of you in those locals, with the community in those locals, and we're gonna do everything we can to fight back. Now, fighting plant closings is not easy. And we know that from 2011, 2012, 2013, but if we mobilize right, the people of the country on our side, the people want better service. And really part of the problem with the 10 year plan right now, even the good stuff, is the immediate thing that has to be fixed it's not eight years down the road, nine years down the road, six years down the road. Those are all important to meet the challenges. What needs to be fixed is the lousy mail service that the people of this country deserve so much better. We want that fixed now. We want legislation now. Those are the things that can be addressed. And we don't want the 10-year plan to get in the way of that. So there's going to be more to come on this battle. Uh, we're, we're battle ready. We're battle steel. This is not new for the American Postal Workers Union. Uh, but it is on us. And if there's good things in the plan that, that the post office is going to do, we're going to unite with those things at the same time that we're going to battle for the people of the country and for our jobs. Now, the Board of Governors is very important in all of this because it's a plan that's been endorsed by the Board of Governors. And as you all know, the new president, not so new anymore, but pretty new, uh, Biden has nominated three of the four vacant, has, not, has placed nominees in for three of the four vacant positions on the Board of Governors. The Board of Governors sets policy. The Board of Governors can hire and fire the PMG. Uh, and so, and the Board of Governors was basically all people from the corporate Wall Street world. They were all men. They were all people that had no experience in the postal system itself. The three nominees, including our former lead counsel, Anton Hajar, have deep postal experience and they bring a much more community and diverse orientation. So just last week, the committee on the Senate side that deals with these confirmations, the Homeland Security uh, Committee held the hearings. They went very well. We understand that the nominees are gonna be quotes marked up, meaning approved by the committee. Uh, tomorrow, we believe, and then it will head to the Senate floor when they're back in session. Uh, so we hope within a few weeks that as soon as they're confirmed, they become governors. And we hope with, a, with, with, with the three new nominees, and there's still one position that we want filled. There's one vacancy that we want filled. We, we, we hope that, that, that the board will help address some of our deep concerns about this plan. So that, that's big news on the Board of Governors, and it's thanks to all of you that this administration acted so quickly. We presented a petition with over 400,000 signatures to do just this, fill the vacancies quickly to help get the post office on the best path going forward. Very quickly, for those who have followed it over the years, we had a big Hatch Act uh, case victory in the courts. Uh, some of you may remember that we, we chat, we're the only union that challenged a management unilateral action that made it much harder for our members to get off work on union business to engage in political activity. It was an effort to stifle our voices, to stifle, stifle the voice of, of postal workers, of working people. And we took that case to arbitration. Brother Zimmerman was in the lead on that, along with the attorney. Some people said it couldn't be done, and we won that case. And the arbitrator said it was a unilateral action. They can't do that without negotiating with us. And they were specifically singling out union time political business from any other person that wanted to use political business. So it was really an attack on the APW and the other postal unions. Management did not accept that award. They went into court to try to overturn it. And the good news is last week, under the pressure of the court, management had to withdraw the case. The arbitration stands. 
It's a real victory for political expression, political activity. That could be voter registration. It could be getting people to the polls. It could be all sorts of things that are so vital to us when we engage in the electoral process. So I thought you would all be very interested uh, in that. Workers' Memorial Day is tomorrow. One of the reasons we're glad to be with you tonight. Workers' Memorial Day is an AFL-CIO commemorative day to reflect upon the people who've been injured and killed at work. Never should happen. But the workplaces are in some, in some industries are killing fields. We have far too many injuries in the post office uh, and far too many deaths. And the COVID pandemic has really brought to the forefront the health and safety issues for all workers. This is the 50th anniversary of OSHA. The Workers Memorial Day is a commemorative day on the day that OSHA was founded, April 28th. Uh, and we're doing something a little different this year. This year, we're asking all of you to also make it a day of action, you and all of your coworkers. And what we're asking people to do is really simple, but it's powerful. And that is look at your workplaces tomorrow or tonight or the next day and identify areas of concern. It could be as simple as blocked doors. Small things can make a huge difference in our health and safety. A real quick story, I've told it many times. In my workplace in Greensboro, North Carolina, I walked by the MDO's office one night, there's a male handler buddy of ours with his finger bandaged, said, what happened? He said, the post town shell fell on his finger and crushed it. It was a bad lock. It's probably a $3 lock, right folks? Right? I said, Gary, you gotta go to the hospital. Oh, I'll be all right. I said, you gotta go, I'll be okay. Long story short, he got a blood disease from that injury and within three years, it killed him. A two or three dollar part. That's how important health and safety can be and how even a small issue can affect our well-being. And so we're asking you to then identify those hazards and fill out a 1767. Brother Vance, when he comes on, we'll talk more about this. 1767 is a great form. It's a report of an unsafe condition, hazard, unsafe condition in practice. And management has to respond. And the more people that do it, the more impact it's going to have. It also creates a paper trail. It creates a record that management's put on notice that these things need to be corrected. So work together with your coworkers. If you're alone in a post office, you, you still have the same rights to identify those unsafe conditions. And we use this form for years. It's not new. We're gonna use it for years to come, but make tomorrow a day that we're given special attention and then let's carry that uh, forward. Uh, and then my last point, because I don't wanna to talk too long, I wanna get in, into the questions and then turn it over to uh, Vance Zimmerman, is national negotiations are upon us. We have bargaining starting on June 22nd. Our contract expires on September 20th. Uh, it's the largest group of employees that are, that are under a collective bargaining negotiation process this year. So we not only have an opportunity and a challenge for an impact of all postal workers and li our lives and the lives of our family and the betterment of our communities, we're going to have an impact on all workers uh, because how we do in such a large bargaining unit can have a positive effect on everybody. We're working hard. We're going to be well prepared. Your core negotiating committee is myself as the lead negotiator. Uh, the vice president, Debbie Zaretti, is on the committee. Uh, uh, the secretary treasurer, Liz Powell, is on the committee. Vance Zimmerman is industrial relations director, is not only on the committee, he's our chief spokesperson. And your four craft directors, Lamont Brooks and the maintenance craft, Otto Balagon, I'm sorry, Lamont Brooks and the clerk craft, I'm, I'm jumping ahead here. I don't Balagon in the maintenance craft, Mike Foster in motor vehicle, and Steve Brooks in support services. We're working together as a team. We're have, we've had a lot of discussions, a lot more to come, a lot of planning. You've all had a say, and, and we've had surveys out there. Give us your thoughts, and we are definitely considering all the input that we can get from the field. Negotiations are not easy, sisters and brothers, APW family. We're not negotiating with ourselves in the mirror. Uh, I, I, you know, we can get looking good with our suits and ties and our, 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 our dresses or whatever we're wearing. We can make great arguments and we will. 
but we're dealing with an opposition. We're not looking at ourselves in the mirror and saying, this is what we want, and we say yes. And that opposition has a very, very different goals than we do. We want to uplift postal workers in our family, period, on all fronts, wages, hours, working conditions, benefits. And the post office wants to reduce costs, and they want to increase workplace flexibility, which means giving them more rights over over our control of our bid jobs, our hours of work, our days off, uh, and so on. So we look forward to the opportunity, but it's not a spectator sport. And how we all engage is gonna have an impact on management. So we are gonna be rolling out a contract campaign soon. We want you to all be involved uh, because when we send the message United to management, up the line that we have earned and deserve, especially in this year of that pandemic, a darn good contract, that message will be heard uh, up, up the line. If you leave it to our own devices or the eight core committee, and by the way, there's a lot of offices that are involved with negotiations beyond the core committee, all the assistant craft directors uh, will be. Uh, if, if you leave it up to us, it's not gonna be as, as, as strong as it can be. And the more we're fighting together, the more we're standing together, the more we're rowing together, the better the outcome of this tough process uh, uh, will be. So with that, I, I want to, I know some questions have already come in ahead of time. Uh, I'll be happy to answer a few of those. And then uh, by 7.30 or so, we'll turn it over to uh, Vance Zimmerman. Thanks very much, President Dimenstein. Yes, indeed, we've gotten lots of questions in advance again and encourage people to drop a question or a comment in the chat as we go on. Uh, the first question comes from Jeanette in St. Paul, Minnesota. She noted that it was a year ago this week that President Trump called the Postal Service a joke in a discussion about a rescue package in Congress. Uh, but she wants to know, what are we doing to push Biden and the Democrats in this new political environment to save the post office? Well, that's a very, like most of the questions coming in, that's a very good question. It's a thought-provoking question, and I, I do very much appreciate that. Uh, and I'm glad we're away, however, people, where we fall on the political spectrum, I think we can all unite that uh, we don't want a president that calls what we do a joke. We're not a joke. And this pandemic and your courageous, dedicated work has proved that once again. But I think there's a lot we can do. I think some of it we've already done. For example, we have pressed the new president before he was installed to pay attention to the vacancies on the Board of Governors, which I referred to briefly earlier. So we were involved with a petition. He took it to the workroom floor, our allies and our friends, 400,000 plus signatures. What did that accomplish? Think about this. You're dealing with a new president who's dealing with secretaries of state, deputy this, secretary of the treasury, secretary of labor, uh, secretary of the, all these top positions. And usually an agency board, is way down on the list, maybe a year or two late. And yet we convinced this president that there was a, there was a, uh, there's a crisis in the post office. We need the best possible and strongest possible board of governors and to address it quickly, and he did. So that's one example where we pressed uh, and we got results. In other areas, I think there's a number of other areas. Legislative reform, we gotta get rid of this pre-funding draconian uh, albatross around the neck of the public postal service. Uh, so the Democrats are going to have to lead that. We want them to lead it on a bipartisan basis. We don't want anybody from any political party, and we, I'm including the Democrats, to treat us as a political football, right? We want Congress to act because they have a responsibility to the people of this country to stabilize the situation in the public postal service. That Congress in 2006, and maybe most of the one who's, ones who are in Congress now aren't part of that, but Congress created a lot of this mess. They have a responsibility to fix it. So we have been in touch, Sister Judy Beard and myself and others, with a number of the key players on, on, on both sides of the aisle, on the, um, on the House side and also on the uh, Senate side. We also are pressing very hard, and I give Kudos to the Postal Board of Governors on this. I obviously don't agree with a lot of other things. But a year ago, they asked for a modernization grant uh, to, for Congress to, you know, normally we don't run on taxpayer dollars, but this is a crisis. We got the $10 billion in COVID relief. 
uh, in, in uh, December. Thanks again to all of your hard work. And the modernization grant would also be tax, taxpayer money that goes into the post office to be able to invest in a fuel efficient fleet, a new fleet, uh, 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 to, to upgrade lobbies and buildings, to upgrade IT. You know, the platforms that the post office uses are ancient right now. They're outdated, but the post office was deprived of funds to be able to in invest. So the infrastructure that the new president has talked about in this country desperately needs an upgrade in its infrastructure from roads to bridges, to hospitals, to railroads, to water systems, to grid, whatever it is. We're glad that's being talked about and we hope it comes to life, but the postal service is a vital part of the infrastructure and we wanna be included in that. So that's another area that we're pressing the, the uh, Democrats as well. We want OSHA to be strengthened. OSHA has become almost in some cases a tool of the companies where they can self-police. So we're looking for this administration to strengthen OSHA. And things like $15 an hour minimum wage that did not make it into the American Rescue Plan, thanks to one uh, parliamentarian, come on, unelected parliamentarian. But $15 an hour is a minimum wage brings up everybody around us. That's our families, that's our friends, that's our neighbors, but it also protects us as unionized workers at the uh, bargaining table. Same with voting rights. Voting rights are critical to postal workers, critical to working people, and yet it's under severe attack, directed to vote by mail. And so we have to make sure uh, that, that, that the, and they have passed, the, the Democrats did lead, lead in passing a bill on the House side that's now gone over to the uh, Senate. And so um, those are, those are some of the things. But at the end of the day, and one of the reasons I love the question is we don't care what people say about us so much as what they do. And so right now, this administration has put some, some, uh, some, some deeds behind their words, but all the other words, we, we have to work on the deeds and that's how we're gonna judge them. And that's how we're gonna judge any elected official. Thanks, Stephen. Sure, thank you. And the next question comes from Jeff in Pennsylvania. He notes he's a PSE, he used to work for Amazon and he was following the election there in Bessemer, Alabama very closely and wanted to know if you had any reaction to what happened uh, in that union drive. I do, uh, thanks Thanks for that question. And, and, and I'm glad we're paying attention to these events swirling around us because they have a direct impact on us. And it really ties into my answer on the last question. So one of the other things we want the Democrats to do and, and, and do it right, is the PRO Act, the Protect the Right to Organize. If anybody has ever been involved or know anybody that's been involved in trying to get a union into their workplace, it's bitter. The companies who refuse to give workers decent raises have no problem spending millions, multi-million dollars to try to keep a union from coming into workplace. And what we saw on Amazon was this multi billion dollar company and multi-billion dollar CEO that, you know, the one person has $165 billion. I mean, you can't even fathom it. I can't even count to zero. At some point you zone out and say, how big is big? Uh, and here are workers that are being run into the ground without bathroom breaks without and wanted a, wanted a voice at work just like we all have. And that company threw everything at them illegally. So I think the good news is that you had a real base of people that really did vote for the union. You had a base of union that were convinced and probably intimidated to not vote for the union. And then you had a lot of people that didn't vote. That means they weren't in the pocket of the company either, but they were maybe afraid to, to, to move forward. But it underscored, and listen, Amazon's our industry. We have, as the, as the APW, we have an interest in organizing Amazon. We've talked to Amazon workers also. If you know any Amazon workers and Amazon's all over the country now, some of our PSEs that have come in maybe used to work at Amazon, maybe have friends and family that work there. Talk to them and if there's ever interest in the union, uh, contact us. But tying it back to my first question is one of the things we need from the Democrats is we need for them to govern. What do I mean by that? You know, I believe in majority rule, not minority rule. So you've heard a lot of talk about the filibuster on the Senate side, where, where legislation gets stopped. And by the way, the filibuster has historically been used to stop uh, social justice legislation like civil rights, voting rights legislation. But the filibuster is saying that the minority rules. And so I tie it back to the PRO Act. The PRO Act is passed 
the House. Most Democratic senators are for it. Not all of them. They have to be worked on. But once they get to 51, they should govern and pass the PRO Act. And when they pass the PRO Act, workers in Amazon, workers in our industry, which needs to be uplifted all across the board, and it will uplift us in the process as well. Uh, the PRO Act will make, it's not, it's, there's still going to be battles, but it'll help level the playing field. So we call upon those who are uh, claimed to be friends of the workers to go out and govern boldly and govern with majority rule. And let's go out and get some stuff done. Thanks very much, President Dimensine. Got another question. This one comes from Sean Cummings in West Brooklyn, New York. Sean asks about the 10 year plan, which you mentioned from the postal management and wants to know how the 10 year plan from PMG to Joy will affect our job security. Oh, uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, I, I, I think there's two edges to that sort. I think that if the plan succeeds in their goal of bringing in more package business, especially in the regional market, uh, uh, repurposing some of the workroom floor space to handle packages better, to be able to bring up IT where packages can be tracked and bring in more business and revenue, that would those kind of things will help our job security. Those things in the plan that want to reduce some hours in rural post offices not only hurts the people, that hurts our job security as well. And anything like the plant closings and slowing down service standards, uh, we, we believe will drive away revenue. And when you drive away revenue, our job security is more at risk. So the positive things in the, in the plan, uh, and, and including some of the ideas of retail, may help with job security. But the negative things in the plan are certainly going to jeopardize our job security. And even within that, it's going to cause more disruption to you as postal workers where these plans go into effect and more disruption to your family uh, 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 as well. So I, I think it's, it's, it, we, we are going to have to see. But one of the reasons we fight back around the bad stuff is one, for the people of the country and the services they deserve, and two, to defend and protect our jobs and our families and our communities. Great. And with that, Stephen, if it's okay, I'd like to uh, introduce to all of you our Industrial Relations Director, Vance Zimmerman, uh, who's doing a hard work and uh, uh, wonderful job in the, in the safety and health issue. He actually led much of the COVID uh, 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 battles with uh, management to try to make the workplace as safe as we could, works with locals and, and uh, your state organizations and, and national officers all over the country. And as I said, he's our chief spokesperson for uh, uh, the upcoming national negotiations. Vance, thanks for, uh, for giving the time tonight to join me. I'll turn it over to you. It's a pleasure to be here with you, brother. Thanks, thanks Mark. It's, it's an honor to be here. It's always good to talk to the members and, and, and to get to answer their questions. And, and I feed, my energy feeds off the chance to talk to the members and see the members. So I, I just, before I start and talking a little facts, I just want to personally thank all the members for what they did for the country in this last year with, with COVID and coming to work every day, moving the mail, proving that they're essential workers. Uh, I believe what you've done the last year uh, coming to work, keeping this country connected has made the post office more relevant for at least 10 more years. This one year, I believe, added 10 years to the Postal Service relevancy, how many dozens of decades away that is. So it, I'm very proud to be representing you. I'm very proud to, be, to have a chance to talk to you tonight. Um, I want to first just, and I'm, I'm going to just talk for a few minutes and then get to the questions because we always want to try to give you what you want to know. Workers Memorial Day is tomorrow, as President Demonstein said. Uh, we ask that you fill out the 1767s. On the website will be a little bit more guide how to do it, where to get the forms. They should be in your work forms. If for some, you know, when you're in time, how management has to get them back to you, whether you want to be anonymous or not. And that's sort of our, it's for Workers Memorial Day honoring the people who's got sick or injured, the Postal Service, not only are their traumatic injuries are too high, but also some repetition that we have where we're pushed more and more with less staff is putting our workers in danger. So we encourage you to show the strength of, of our union by, by doing that tomorrow. I want to um, 
talk uh, just for a couple minutes about the EFEL, and, and I'm just sort of mentioning and piggyback on one of Mark's questions that he answered. The EFEL leave is proof that we went to the Biden administration and the Democratic Party and said, our workers need more protection for when they get COVID and time off, they reacted. And then another part of that bill is uh, making it easier if you get COVID at work to file an OWCP claim. And that, that's retroactive. So, and I'll just real short, an OWCP claim, you have to show a causal effect, which means you have to prove that it happened at work. Well, that's very almost impossible to prove that you had COVID at work, but then they changed the, the law, which made it an assumption that if you get COVID and you're at work, that, that you get it. So it's, I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. Um, EFEL, as, as Mark mentioned, um, we were a big part of that. We, we got it enacted. I know PM's taken forever to give guidance. Uh, supposedly it's supposed to be out by the end of the week. Uh, management has extended it two weeks at a time. That expires um, tomorrow. Management will be putting out something tomorrow to extend it again uh, to make up until the OPM comes out. So if you, you have any questions about that or if your coworkers, you can tell them that, that you got on with President Dimenstein and found out here first that that will be extended by management also tomorrow. Um, uh, I wanna talk about postal calls and explain that, why we oppose it a little bit and then tie it into our contract. Um, Postal pulse management's rolling that around again. They do it once a year and suddenly they care so much about your thoughts, your meanings, and they're your best friend. Fill this out so we know what you think. The other 51 month, weeks, not so much. You know, um, and you have to wonder why. You have to also wonder why suddenly they're, you know, they're, they're hiding behind uh, bushes and jumping out. Don't forget that postal pulse that they're pushing you, they're sending you emails, they're reminding you. Uh, and you'll, you'll see that the APW says, do not fill them out. And I'm going to explain why we don't want you to fill them out. And, and Mark talked about, we have contract actions and, and the contract teams will be rolling out. I consider this first act on the postal calls, your first act to show the strength of the APWU and that all of the people are behind us. So when me and Mark and the, the sitting at the table that they know 120,000 uh, members are behind us or 150,000, I'm sorry. Um, so, what management did several contracts ago, they asked 27 questions. The first 26 questions were, does your supervisor listen to you enough? Does your supervisor respect you? Could your be supervisor be more passionate when you need leave? Could your supervisor realize that you know more about the operation than them? These things, and they're like, wow, somebody finally gets this. They got to question 27 and it says, are you satisfied with your wages and benefits? And after the people had filled out 26 things about how they're frustrated at work and, and their work environment, they said, sure, it's not the pay and benefits, it's the managers that aggravate me. Well, they took those surveys, they took the first 26 and they, they tossed them, threw them away. And then they took number 27. And when we went to interest arbitration and demanded raises and benefits, they came right across and says, the APW doesn't speak for us. Look, we asked the members the workers on the floor and they said they don't want to raise and they don't want to increase benefits. So don't think you can tear it up. You can tear it up in pieces and send it in. They get credit and it counts as somebody responding. If you answer negatively on every one, it counts as a respond. So please take the first action you can do. Uh, you can't be in the room when we're negotiating. You're not going to be in that room, but the first action you can show that you want to raise and you want to benefits and keep your rights and that you're strong with the APW, just say, just say no, like uh, the postal pulse. So I want to take a minute and explain that and how that factors into everything. Um, uh, so just a, real fast on the contract. Um, it is rolling up June 22nd. Um, we've been preparing for a long time. We're going to be pushing for PTF issues. Uh, about 15% of the clerk craft are PTFs. Uh, we'll be pushing hard on Article 1. There's work in level 18 offices that are being done every week by Postmaster. That work is work that we are going to fight to get back. Uh, we, we understand the, the scheduling issues and the issues of, of 
of the guarantees, et cetera, those are high on our priorities. We'll also be looking, um, you know, one of the things Mark failed to mention in the 10 year plan and the uh, PMG said about the Congress, PMG acknowledged that there was a PSE retention problem. So we will use that in negotiations to push for conversion rights, more career jobs and the like. We also will be talking very much about how you worked hard this last year to prove the work and that you deserve a fair raise, a full COLA that protects the COLA. So every time inflation goes up, you're protected. Um, I don't have time to go in great detail about the contract, but uh, I'm just telling you that we're prepared. We're working on it every day we, um, and, and we'll be ready to fight for you because you deserve us collectively to be strong to get a contract that you deserve. Um, with that, Mark, I, I think it's just better at this point that we just go to some questions if you're okay with that. And Sounds good. Sounds good, Vance. Thanks so much. Stephen, we got, we got some questions for Vance and I. That's and right. Vance and I can argue about who's going to answer it first and who's going to answer it second. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that sounds great. I'll just ask the questions and you can figure the rest out. So That's the, right. The first one comes from Ricardo. He works in Denver uh, and he wants to know if uh, you believe we will continue to have PSEs in the clerk craft since the maintenance and MVS crafts have done away with this class of employees. Vance, take it away. Um, so it's certainly a goal of the APWU to elim eliminate PSEs in all crafts. Um, under Mark's leadership, we were able to limit or get rid of the PSEs in the maintenance craft and the MVS craft. We'll continue to try to make strides before that in the clerk craft and move that. And that's definitely our goal. And that will be our demand. Um, I do not think, and certainly in one fail swoop, that we're going to get back, um, get rid of PSEs at, at one time. We'll, we'll continue to fall away at that. The last interest arbitration, there's a we have we we have these two levels and of uh, pay where the people after 2010 do not move to the top. We were able in the last interest tar arbitration at level six, seven, and eight to call two of those back. We'll continue to try that. Well, the same theory applies with the PSEs. Our goal is going to be to eliminate PSEs in the clerk craft, and we'll strive for that, but it may take many contracts to move in that direction, but we'll continue to try to do that. You wanna add on I that agree. That's I agree with you, brother. Great, well, the next question comes from Chiffon in Frisco, Texas. Wants to know if you've got a postmaster that makes your office a hostile work environment. Is that an OSHA issue? Uh, and if not, what, what else can be done about that? You know, I, it's 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 not an OSHA issue per se. It's not something OSHA will take complaints on, but it's a very important question. The abusive work environment in some areas is something this union has been trying to address for decades. And I'll ask Vance to finish up the question because we now have some task forces in place to try to address this. Uh, the uh, 1767 around Workers Memorial Day. That's an area where you can rally your workers, your uh, co-workers. I'm sorry to work together, fill those out, demand the change, and certainly work with your uh, local union. But Vance, I'm, I'm sure you got some other things to add to this one. Sure. Um, in the last contract, um, we were able to get a work environment MOU um, because we, we realized that there is some hostile work environments and, um, and, and those need addressed. Um, we started that memo to, to roll it out, um, COVID hit, and we haven't quite honestly been able to do too much with that. Uh, we'll try to enhance that memo in the next contract. But I just want to talk about a few options we have. OSHA is not an option, but you have a few other options. Mark mentioned the 1767, and you can work, work, work with your local union to file a, a grievance. But there's also something called the Pub 553. And, and some of the things what you want to do with this, these hostile work environments because you have a problem with the postal service where they'll take a postmaster or, or what I like to refer to them as problem children and they'll, they'll take the supervisor that's caused an issue with the workforce and they'll just move them somewhere else. So it's important that everything sort of gets documented. So there's a few uh, or something called the pub 553 and there's a process that when you invoke that it's in writing 
management has to do investigations. They have to come to a conclusion. Uh, there's also something called a threat assessment team. Uh, that's publication 108. Again, there's a whole publication on how it is supposed to, to work. I think it's important to, to realize uh, a quote from that publication, which is also the former BMG quoted this and put it as out. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna I actually have, I'm gonna read it here. Remember, postal policy declares not every instance of inappropriate behavior may fit the legal de definition of harassment. However, such behavior at work violates the Postal Service standards of conduct. You need to report it, pursue it, and don't tolerate it. Um, the APW has a webpage dedicated to helping fighting workers harassment. So if you go to the APW website, to the DIR page, you're going to see all this information I'm going to talk about on there. I don't know if Steve has some of this information. He may be able to pop in the chat. Um, so it's a possibility that you can file EEO. If it meets one of the criteria in, in Article 2, you can file an EEO. Uh, but again, it doesn't have to rise to the level that you can file an EEO for it to be harassment in, in the publication. So you've got several options there to enforce it. And, uh, and I just I encourage people to just, you know, it's, you just got to build a paper trail a lot of times to get these issues resolved. So uh, I, I suggest you take every one of these options that, if you're having those problems. And, and, and organize your coworkers, organize with your union. Uh, and if it gets uh, too extreme, don't be afraid of taking it public. Uh, there's, there's should be no place for harassment and abuse in the post office on the part of management. And we know historically, it's one of those issues that management has never dealt with. And we're gonna keep pressing and really do appreciate the uh, question. So, so, so Mark, can I ask you to, I believe you, you'll be able to uh, identify the place and give a, a little example of what you just said. Um, it was either up in Connecticut or New Hampshire where there was a, a troubled PMG and, and, and the people took it to the streets. And uh, I, I, I don't know if you can recall the exact place. It was a small facility, a hand, is that? Yeah, it, it's not ringing a bell um, right now, but the post office does okay. not, they do not, they, they do respond often to the publicity, the negative publicity when it's principled, when it could be back up with facts. Don't be afraid of taking things public, but you're gonna have to organize with your coworkers so that you're not standing alone. Uh, and if you're in a very small place where you may be the only or, or a person, or there's just a couple of you, that's the importance of working with your local union and your state organization uh, to uh, move it forward. But these, these issues are very hard to deal with alone, much easier to deal with together. And in the union, we're really together. So that, that is the place to deal with. Great, thanks. Thanks both. Uh, getting lots of questions about PTFs in the chat again. Uh, this one comes from Angela in Spavanaugh, Oklahoma. She wants to know, what are the plans for PTFs in the new contract? Uh, we shouldn't have to drive all over the place to get a 40 hour work week. A two hour guarantee per pay period is insulting. And I'll just add that there's lots of questions about PTFs and the issues of conversions uh, for PSEs, et cetera, if you want to take some time on those as well. Well, I'll turn that over to, 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 to Brother Zimmerman because he already addressed uh, in, in broad strokes some of our, uh, uh, said some of the priority treatment that we want to give this issue in the upcoming uh, national negotiations. So Vance, take it away. First of all, let, let, me, let me talk about the two hour guarantee uh, pay period is insulting. And, and we have, agree 110%. Uh, we're, we're, um, management continually hears, hears that from your DIR and your president, and we push that, and, and we'll be pushing for more guarantees. Uh, I think the best way to try to address that PTF gets more hours in their home installation is what I put, made reference to um, earlier on, is to find a way to return that 15 hours of work to the level 18 offices. If we can get that work returned, that the bar, that the postmasters are doing, uh, even if it's 10 hours worth of work a week, uh, you know, if it's, they're not doing the whole 15, well, that's 10 more hours you get to work in your home installation, you don't have to travel. So um, 
we're going to be looking at that. We're going to be looking at scheduling. We're going to be looking at um, maybe even some longer guarantees when you have to report back for the second time. Um, so um, I can tell you we've got numerous, uh, you know, I, I can't tell you the results of the negotiations, but I can tell you that that's high on our priority and to try to get to address those PF, PTF concerns. That's one of the reasons I sort of mentioned uh, I'm a numbers guy, you know, that, that there's 18,000 PTFs out of 120,000 clerks, which is a 15% of the clerk craft. So we're looking at ways to enhance their opportunities uh, in, in several different ways, and, and we'll do our best to uh, come through. Thanks, Vince. And, and uh, I, I just got a reminder in a text from uh, our good business agent, Steve Lukosis up in New England, that it was Barry Vermont, Barry Vermont that we took into the streets uh, because of abusive management. So that may have been the example you were thinking of, Vance. So, uh, and uh, we, we, we sent a really strong message and management was forced to straighten up some. So it's a good example of, uh, that, that we shouldn't be afraid of the streets and taking it into these press conferences, informational pickets when things get to a certain boiling point. Great, thanks, Mark. The next question comes from Vince. He works in Whittier, California. Uh, I get the impression he's a TTO and he asks, can we stop management from adding and changing our daily bidded schedules and are we entitled to receive premium pay? Yeah, it's, uh, Stephen, is it clear whether the uh, brother asking the question is a uh, full-time regular or PTF? We're not Can sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, there's look, the, the bid job has to be respected. That's one of the great advantages of seniority and bidding. If you're a full-time regular, you have a route, you have a bid. If they change it, they, they, you have out of schedule pay, you have overtime. If they're bringing you in early or keeping you late, if you're a PTF, then it's a then it's a different uh, challenge. Vance, you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, just a little bit. So, so I'm going to answer. I'm going to answer their question uh, as if they're a full time regular. Um, and some of this would not apply to a PTF. It would not apply to a PTF. But I'm going to answer it as if they're a full time regular. There's language in the Elm and Section 434 of the Elm. You can look. And section 434 of the Elm deals with out of schedule pay. If you get the, a Wednesday notice prior, you get a premium of additional 50%. If you don't get the Wednesday notice prior of the week, you get additional premium on top of that. Um, uh, it's 434.62B, which is um, says that you have the right to work your own schedule. And therefore, if you they change your schedule like the day before by three hours, well, you have a right to work your own schedule or get uh, admin leave for it. And then so you would actually get, they change it by three hours, you get eight hours straight time, uh, two hours of overtime and one hour of penalty. So that, so the language is specifically, uh, it would be an article eight violation if they were doing it to a full-time regular and the specific language in the ELM is 434.62. Thank you, Vince. Great. So the next question comes from Terry Frazier Grimes. She wants to know what are we going to do about them turning so many full time regular jobs into nifty jobs? Terry says the hours are still there. Well, that's an interesting question because uh, uh, send us some more information on that. In the 2015 round of bargaining, which was the first one I led after coming into office in late 2013. Uh, we had uh, an unlimited amount of nifties allowed in, um, in, in function four retail. And uh, if I remember correctly, about 50% allowed in function one. We eliminated the nifties in that contract in function one, which is mail processing. And we capped it in function four, which is retail to 8% nationwide. Now, management could play games with those figures and put a lot into one area but they have to remain under that percentage nationwide. So we did get it under control. But if you're a non-traditional full-time and the hours are there, 
then there are ways under the contract, particularly Article 37, 37.3A1, I believe, where you can cobble the hours together for preferred duty assignments. And a, a full-time uh, regular assignment would be preferred over a non-traditional full-time assignment. So there are ways in particular offices. Now, if you happen to be in a uh, six-hour post-plan office uh, and you're a non-traditional full-time there, and it has to be an effort to try to cobble some of those hours with other work in another office within the installation to try to get the full-time regular assignment. But we have gotten it a lot under control. Uh, and if we need to look at it some more, we're, we're certainly um, uh, happy to. It may be more of a question of enforcing what's already in place and our rights that we already have than whether we need to make any further changes in the national agreement at the bargaining table starting in June. Vance may have something he would like to add to that. If not, well, first of all, it's, it's very impressive that the president of the union can jump off exactly what section the ELM is applicable to the, to the point for the out of schedule. And then he did, he is correct that it most likely is an enforcement issue under 37381 of the contract and he described it correctly. The only thing I wanna sort of add to that, there was a national level case on a different issue on 37.3A1 that we, the union was not successful in, but that doesn't alter at all when we're trying to make a full-time position. And, and if, so, so, so if management or, or somebody tells you, well, no, 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 that's that was off. It was a national award that the union wasn't successful. It's not accurate in this situation. In fact, that national award, management acknowledged that they had to do exactly what Mark described in that award. Thank you. Great, thanks, Vance. Next question comes from Aaron Young. He was watching on YouTube. Uh, he goes back to the Hatch Act victory that you mentioned at the talk, President Dimensine wants to know, will management finally remove the language on the PS Form 3971 that they added, which created the situation in the first place? If so, do you have a time frame of when that change may occur? Good question. I'm gonna ask Vance to jump in. He's uh, led this fight and uh, he's, he's, he's on top of this issue, Vance. Oh, yes, thank you. So they withdrew this last Friday. Uh, prior to them withdrawing it, um, we actually could, I met with management and got a commitment that they would uh, remove the 3971s. And also they will be changing the helm to go back to the way it was. Uh, it will typically um, to make changes of the elm, et cetera, it will take like 30 or 45 days, but in all practicality, um, uh, you should be able to use the ones that don't have that on there. A little secret is all you gotta do is Google 3971 and print it out. And the one you Google does not have that language on it, but yes, management will be uh, putting it back the 3971 and the elm. And if it can't be done in 30 days, they're supposed to notify me why that there's a, an issue to get it done, but they're you're taking actions right now to get that done. Uh, thanks for that question. And and, and yes, we're the APWU is, is always strong at, at our voice and we've had a lot of success and um, we fight very hard anytime anybody tries to, to stifle us. Really important victory, really thanks. important victory. Stephen, we got a couple more minutes. One last question or here's two. A, here's a short one probably. Do we know the 18 plants that were on the list that the Postal Service announced today? Yes, they sent us a list of the 18 plants. I've sent it out to all of the national officers, uh, the e-board, the um, resident officers, and the business agents. Uh, I don't have it in, in the front of me. And this is probably the first round of more efforts that management's gonna make in this direction. But this particular group of 18, management is claiming that they're just starting off where they stopped and they're there for therefore they don't have to do new community meetings they don't have to do new uh, uh amp studies and we disagree with that and we put them on notice and we're going to be uh moving forward on on all of these fronts and if there's another round uh management is committed to do the community meetings the full studies and that'll give us a lot of opportunity as postal workers unionized postal workers to unite with the communities and to uh, fight back for good mail service, good jobs. And look, these plants have a key economic life in the communities that they're in. And so rallying the mayors and the city councils and the county commissioners and the, even the chambers of commerce, which are normally not on the side of workers, 
uh, we have a lot of opportunity. In fact, Vance led a fight, helped lead a fight in Cincinnati when he was business agent uh, in, in that region when they tried to close the Cincinnati plant. And they had the Chamber of Commerce on their site. And they were able to keep that plant open. So it's, it's, it's not a futile battle. It's not a hopeless battle. It's going to be a tough battle. Uh, so, yeah, we, we uh, do have the um, 18 plants. Great. And maybe this uh, this next question will be the last one. It comes from Catherine in Maryland. She's a window clerk. Uh, she read the 10 year plan, notes that there's a lot of talk about transforming the retail experience in the plan. Uh, what were your reactions to that? And, and what's the view of the union about the future of retail at the post office? Yeah, the, again, another um, excellent question. Our view is that there's some opportunity in there. It's not well explained in the plan. We've contacted headquarters management and asked for a meeting uh, with, with their top people to deal with retail about what some of their ideas are. We think a lot of the future of the post office uh, uh, will come down to using this wonderful national infrastructure and these retail units in new ways. We're particularly focused as a union on expanded financial service, tremendous social problem in the country with the unbanked and the underbanked. The ability to, uh, we, we've done financial services for years with money orders. We once had a postal bank for almost 60 years in, in, in this country. So there's huge opportunities on the retail side. And we, 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 we're going to spend some time digging in with management about putting some meat on the bones uh, uh, on this. And of course, our clerk craft leadership, Brother Lamont Brooks, will be deeply involved in these conversations and ideas. And we're going to be also very cognizant of the fact that as we try new things, we also have to make sure you're properly staffed and that, the, that it's not extra pressure on you as the worker. It's not extra pressure on a customer with longer lines. We want new services, more uh, new services, but we want to make sure that we're staffed to carry out those services in the um, right way. And by the way, we also think it's a contradiction in the plan to talk about new um, ideas for retail, which we welcome. And then in some areas of the country where maybe people aren't as heavily populated or as well to do, they're talking about cutting retail hours. And our point already made to management, let's go out and try some of these new things and not cut any hours. Let's look at expanding hours and let's look at all sorts of new services. But I believe that a lot of the future of the post office rests on the post office doing new things through the retail units, a lot of the European posts, 50% uh, of their revenue or more comes from financial services, which is definitely part of the postal mission in connecting the people of, of the country. So we're excited, but we probably at this point don't know much more than you do. And I'm really pleased that people are digging into the plan, making their assessments, thinking about it, uh, not throwing out the baby with the bathwater, fighting the bad, but then looking at some of the positive like you have. Uh, 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 you know, where, where it might help us as workers and help the people of the country. And I see we're at the witching hour of eight o'clock. We promise you a one hour live stream. We're going to stick to it. Uh, we hope we answered a lot of your questions. The questions were great. We really appreciate it. Brother Vance and I and the other national uh, leaders really do appreciate uh, the, the input. Uh, and it's particularly in a COVID world where we have not been able to travel, we've not been able to see a lot of the activists that we would normally see. Uh, and so we very much value the uh, questions and the comments. Uh, I'll, I'll just say that I look forward to seeing you next month. We'll set it up towards the end of uh, May. We'll be much closer to negotiations. We'll have new information then. We'll have updates on the Board of Governors. We'll have, hopefully we'll have some answers about what the plan looks like on some of these retail ideas. Uh, and and uh, we, as long as you're interested in doing these meetings, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege for me and the people that join us to uh, join with you. So on that note, I'll not only mention again, remind you of Workers Memorial Day on the 28th, May 1st is International Workers Day. Happy May Day. It was born in the United States in the fight for the eight hour day. It's a day that says, and Amazon's a good example. It's a worldwide company that we have to be united worldwide to be able to take on our adversaries and these bosses that have their foot on the, 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 the foot on us every day to maximize their uh, profits. So with that, uh, thanks so much for spending the time with us and solidarity forever. Keep up all the great work. 
serving the people of the country and all the great work, making sure our union is as strong and powerful as it can be. And next month, we'll talk a little more, the month after, about the 50th anniversary of the founding of the APW, which was July 1st, 1971. Take care, everybody. Thanks again. Solidarity forever.